Welcome to another edition of Around with Randall, your weekly podcast on making your nonprofit more effective for your community. And here is your host, the CEO and founder of Hallett Philanthropy, Randall Hallett. I can't thank you enough for joining me again on this episode of Around with Randall. And today I want to talk a little bit about a tough subject uh, that sometimes causes, uh, in particular, healthcare more trouble uh, than most when it becomes public and unfortunately has been heightened over the past six to ten weeks as the COVID vaccine is pushed out, thank goodness, into our communities. Today's subject is concierge medicine, special constituent services, uh, anything that is along that line. And uh, let me start with some bigger concepts, and then we'll get into some of the more specifics, and we'll end, as we always do, with some tactical suggestions. Is, is number one, it, w- there's been a, n- a bunch of literature on this subject over the past couple of years, more so because of the growth of grateful patient philanthropy, and it's tied together because really what we're talking about is how you take care of patients and their families during the continuum of care. So there's the journal for the American Medical Association has come out with a number of, of conversations about this. There are the there have been several associations that have come out and discussed it. Um, and then we've kind of gone into a hyperdrive of this conversation. Unfortunately, it's not studies or experts, but it's the news. And at least for my philosophy is, is that if you're being written about it's either really good or really bad and generally not somewhere in between if it's the news that's writing about it. Unfortunately, there's been a number of cases and stories where organizations who are responsible for providing the virus, uh, or excuse me, the vaccine for the virus, have created their own lists. And maybe the one that caught my attention just because I know the organization and some of the people there was the University of Rochester Medical Center who has a very defined, longstanding uh, special constituency concierge program that they use for stewardship throughout the the entire university, not just medical, to be thankful for those donors who make a difference in the life and being of the University of Rochester. In this case, they took those donors and moved them up the particular COVID-19 list for vaccinations, and that caused an uproar, and as it should. Uh, I don't think anyone indicates that that is a good idea by any stretch. The result was, is that the university president, I believe, or chancellor, CEO, had to disband the program overnight and remove uh, a decent sized staff and put them back into more clinical driven areas. Uh, take f- facilities that had been raised uh, with uh, philanthropic dollars and dismantle them literally overnight. And in some ways, I can't disagree with what the chancellor slash president did. I, I get a lot of phone calls here recently about, well, how do we handle this with our board? How do we handle this when donors call? And I've been very clear to say, if you're trying to move them beyond what your local health, usually county, but it could be city, health officials are indicating are the proper protocols and sequencing for those receiving priority, you're wrong, period. That the experts in our leadership and health and our government entities are driving priority in terms of who gets it. And it's done differently in other places. For me here in Nebraska, the governor has been very specific with his health advisors by age. For other places, they prioritize teachers and first line uh, health workers. I- I'm not here to argue one or the other. I- I'm not don't have the data to support one way or the other. But what I know is, is if you're not on the list and you're being moved up because you wrote a check, that's not a good thing for the community. It's not a good for your thing for your nonprofit. This has brought up a lot of conversations about overall programming. And I, I want to start with the concept of the difference between fee for service and a stewardship model. Fee for services is where someone pays a set fee, and they receive services. It's not philanthropic. 
And you're seeing this grow in the physician's area, nurse practitioner area for primary care. It's a business model. Some organizations and health institutions have taken advantage of that and created their own models. And that's terrific. There's a very clear understanding is is you pay for X and you get Y in return. There is an argument that says, well, that creates two medical systems. I can't argue with that either. What I find to be the most valuable when done correctly is the stewardship model, meaning we don't distinguish between the value of a gift and you know what somebody gets. This is about communication. It's about helping someone navigate a difficult, complex organization that is healthcare. And we would do that for anyone. I have set up a number of these programs. If someone who needed help called, we didn't say we weren't going to help them because they hadn't made a gift. We help them. But we make this navigation process, not clinical process, known. There were a number of times where I had the ability to know, based on HIPAA compliant data, who had come into the hospital and maybe into the ED. And I was very clear with our donors about what could and couldn't happen. And anything that interfered with the decision-making process of a clinician, a doctor or nurse of how treatment should occur is not going to be something we do. I did not go to medical school. I did not go to nursing school. And frankly, no, neither did anybody on my team. We allow people to be treated by those individuals who have that expertise. So how does this all get to this point? Well, number one, it's important to know that generationally, and I put my parents into this category, the idea of the baby boomers, maybe you know, 46 generally to about 70, maybe just before 1970, uh, control about 70 to 75% of the disposable income in the United States. And they are very used to getting their own way. Burger King and Starbucks have created an entire marketing effort over generations. Have it your way. Starbucks being able to order any cup of coffee you want, however you want. This is by design because that generation has come to appreciate that they can have whatever it is they want when they want it. And when a healthcare episode comes up, that thought process doesn't just disappear. This is a generation also that is more dependent on -on one-on-one communication. It's not that they're running from Twitter or social media or Facebook or anything else, but generally they like more one-on-one communication, which means the one-on-one communication a foundation or development office provides is right up their alley. The advisory board came out with something a couple of years ago, and I'm going to actually read it because I want to get it correct, from a 2013 report about why these special services and areas have popped up. And I quote, rather than delaying initial contact with prospects until after discharge, best practice development programs identified individuals while still in the hospital and then take steps to improve the patient experience. While not dramatically moved by luxury items, most patients deeply appreciate personal support and care, which overtaxed medical providers are often ill-positioned to provide. By offering these services, development executives find they can increase the level of patient gratitude and facilitate the formation of philanthropic relationships. The other thing that should be noted here is is if you're in a uh, maybe a multi-hospital area or system where maybe a little bit larger community, competition is is keen for this. Uh, I have a client that I work with very closely who's doing this build out. Part of the reason is is they have donors who said, I can go here or I can go here, I can go here, and they're going to take better care of me than you do. So there's a pressure. So if we know that this is something that's being pushed and we know that we want it to be for stewardship and if you're fee for service and you're probably closer to the ocean, meaning West coast, East coast or South, that may we work in some major metropolitan areas, not here to deny that, but most of the time it's stewardship driven. And we know we have to be very careful because if it's done incorrectly, it's just wrong. Not only is it bad marketing and, and reputational 
uh, harm to the organization if something happens. It's just plain wrong if we're treating and getting donors better access. So what is it that I've experienced that might be helpful to you? How do you kind of begin to think about this? And this is the tactical part of the conversation. And so let me start with some high-level things, and we'll get into some of the specifics. Tactically, you need to always be cognizant. This is about patient experience, not patient care, and absolutely under no circumstance, donor care. I in my practice days have built a program where I literally made sure that if anybody needed help, whether they gave a gift or not, we're going to help. That's what our culture should be. Yes, there are those who made a significant financial difference philanthropically that knew how to get a hold of us a little bit easier, but we helped everybody because patient experience should be at the forefront of everything that we do in healthcare. Number two, less is more. If you're trying to go from a horse and buggy to a Ferrari, there's about 80 to 90 models and variations of cars between the two. Start with the Model T. Simpler is better. Build slowly. Start small. You'll thank yourself. So those are kind of overreaching thoughts. What about some tacticals, tactical things. Number one, the most important thing is is to over-communicate internally, internally about what actually is occurring. You start with the leadership team, helping them to understand the value of of, of an appropriate program, getting their buy-in and making sure that they can articulate why this is being done for those that ask questions. And there will be questions and there should be questions. That communication then goes into service line or nurse managers or others to be very clear that there's not a a better closet of medicine, or as I used to tell donors, I I, I can't move you up in the triage in the ED. We have limitations to this process. So defining and communicating what that looks like internally is really, really important. On the same side is communicating and setting expectations on the external. When we built out a program, and when I've done this with clients, I really push very heavily for there to be a really strong message around, and this is my example, you go into the ED, and this happened to me a number of times, and I would be notified that so-and-so was in the ED. I'd go down, either in the middle of the night, drive down, or I'd go from my office, And I would go and I'd sit in the waiting area. I can get them a cup of coffee. They want me to run the cafeteria to get them some food. If they want me just to hold their their hand, I'm glad to do so. But the triaging uh, decision-making process about who needs care, that's handled by the professionals. And I'm not involved in that. So I wanted to make sure that donors understood what we were talking about here. Yes, you might get a little bit more of my time. Yes, I might be willing to go get you a cup of coffee. But you're not going to get better care. Everybody receives the same outstanding care. The decisions of what that care is are left to the professionals. And my job was to clarify if you had any non-medical issue questions. That expectation level is really important. Establishing it both internally and externally can be the difference between problem and a smooth sale. Because if you don't establish it on the outside expectations begin to grow and you have to be willing to say there's certain things we don't do. One of the things I found to be most valuable was as we went along and we could afford it. And I've had a couple of places I've helped build the program and they've done the same is to actually have a clinical person working in the foundation or development office who does this work and set up an enormous Chinese wall that what, and hopefully a nurse could be a PA or a doc, but most of the time it's a nurse who can go into clinical situations, have a much better understanding of what's going on. And they have a clear understanding that they're not practicing medicine anymore. They're practicing communication. And maybe they're getting somebody a cup of coffee. 
But much like my role when I was in the ED that I discussed a minute ago, they're not going to move the needle on triaging or medical decisions either. They just have a better understanding of what's going on. They're an expert because of their training and expertise. That makes everyone more comfortable in that scenario. Having them be a part of the foundation team and understanding what philanthropy is, and at the same time, and more importantly, having an understanding of the clinical environment can be invaluable in eliminating a lot of problems. So if it's possible, maybe it's a halftime person, maybe it's somebody who's going towards retirement, but having someone who knows the organization, knows people in the organization, and can explain what they do is critically important. It also takes major gift officers off the floors in the hospital. I had a client building out a program. We did a focus, series of focus group with clinicians, and they said, we hear the click of those heels coming down the hallway, and we know they're from the foundation. And it was aggravating because the clinical people didn't understand what the foundation was doing. And frankly, I would argue that the least amount of time a major gift officer spends inside the hospital on floors in rooms is a good thing. If you're being requested because they're a longtime donor or have a great relationship, that's something different. But just running into the hospital without checking with a floor nurse or finding out what's going on, if it's an appropriate time to, to see someone, we have no idea most of the time what clinically is going on for a patient. It may not be the right time. Having someone who's more clinically bound can greatly enhance the ability to, to triage, not medical, but is it appropriate? And number two, getting non-clinical people out of the clinical environment. Lastly, I would articulate that the ability to clearly define boundaries is important. Even if a nurse who moves into, let's say, some type of relationship opportunity within the foundation has taken a million blood draws, they're not going to do that. And you have to explain that. Even though the organization values everyone receiving the same treatment and everyone should receive the same treatment, explaining the where the, the foundation or development office begins or ends is critically important. Boundaries and clearly explaining their, their depth, their width, will create a much better opportunity for your organization to alleviate a lot of problems. Concierge, special constituent services, whatever you want to call, can be very complicated. And if done correctly, can be gratefully harmful. But when done correctly, and I've seen it done really, really well, where it's not interfering with clinical care, can be the difference at times for multiple millions of dollars of opportunities. That money is put right back into the clinical environment to make a difference for the next series of patients who need help. That's the essence of nonprofit. How do we get the community support to serve the community's need? And this is just another avenue of doing that. And doing it correct is greatly, greatly important. Just a couple of reminders as we do at the end of each show. If you like what you're hearing, you're watching this on the YouTube channel, Hallett Philanthropy, you're reading it, please subscribe, like, leave a comment, share with those that might find this valuable. This is just teaching. And based on a lot of wisdom and experience and a whole heck of a lot of mistakes. So if you find it valuable, help share it. If you find something you disagree with, email me at reeks, R-E-E-K-S, reeks at halletphilanthropy.com. And if you have a suggestion for our show, podcast, and this, by the way, today's episode was a suggestion from a client who said, gosh, could you talk a little bit more about this? Podcast at halletphilanthropy.com. Don't forget there's blogs on the website, two or three a week. Minute read, minute and a half read max might give you something to think about in our industry or professional life. This is a great profession. I, I, I say that each podcast, I say that every day, but I believe in it. I don't feel like I work that hard because I am so fortunate and have been throughout my career to only basically do non, not basically, only do nonprofit work. I hope you feel the same. I hope you think you're making a difference for people and your community through the organization you represent knowing that people need help in various ways in our communities from government assistance to others can't do everything. Nonprofits fill holes. They're critical to the life and being of your community.
So I'll conclude with this as I do each and every time, my favorite saying. Some people make things happen. Some people watch things happen. Then there are those who wondered what happened. Nonprofit work, the work you do every day, is pairing people who want to make things happen with your organization who's trying to do the same, to take care of, to help, a hand up for people who are wondering what happened. And that, that's good stuff, people. That is the essence of a great life, is making a difference in somebody else's. I'll look forward to seeing you next time right here on Around with Randall. Don't forget, make it a great day. Mm -hmm.